drip, drip, drip. Water was coming out of our ceiling. It was quite a while ago, but Evelyn and I and Phoebe, we were playing in the hallway of our home on the floor, and it was a beautiful sunny spring day, <laughs> and I felt a drop of water hit my leg. And you kind of think, why? Why is there water hitting my leg? I'm in the hallway. And I looked up, drip, and it was coming, water was coming out of our smoke alarm. And again, I needed a microsecond. Is water supposed to come out of smoke alarm? No, no. So uh, we had a drain pipe that was clogged. And so the condensate uh, from our HVAC system uh, was draining out into the attic and then through the smoke alarms. And it was a smoke alarm fountain. It's a water feature in our home. <laughs> but it reminded me of the importance of having clear pipes. <laughs> clear pipes. There are conduits in this room. Um, yeah. Here's a conduit. Uh, there are conduits in this room. Some of, sometimes you've probably noticed them that hold wires. We have uh, water pipes in this sanctuary back there and back here. We have optical fiber conduits over in that direction that carry our worship to folks for streaming. Um, but I think sometimes we can fail to notice the conduits all around us. You, you, and me. We are concluding our I Can Relate Conduit series today, our series for the month of September, of how we are the vessels that carry the presence of God's hope and love in the world. God prefers to do God's work through us. And so the question is, have you been clogged lately? Is God's spirit flowing through you in the way it should? Let's review our Conduit series. We started weeks and weeks ago with Genesis, the story of Cain and Abel, anti-brotherly love, murder, that shows us so strongly how God gives us to each other for bonding, for blessing. Then we, the next week, we ventured into the New Testament, 1 John 3, and we saw the practicalities of how God becomes evident in real life practices, not just thoughts. And then on September 15th, we ventured into the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2, and we remembered how Jesus is our high priest, the great mediator whose spirit works between us, among us. Last Sunday, Pastor Ken took us down to the Jordan River and the story of Joshua, uh, the ark and the stones, and how a great way we move forward in life is by remembering backwards how God's faithfulness has provided for us. Today we're going to wrap up our I Can Relate series with the what. The what, what actually flows through these conduits? Well, the answer is love. Love. Today's passage, 1 Corinthians 13 is perhaps one of the most familiar passages of the Bible to folks in this world. It's often called the love chapter. It's recited at weddings. Parts of it are written on greeting cards. Uh, sometimes parts of 1 Corinthians 13 are on banners or placed on walls. And we have to be careful because familiarity can bring comfort, yes, but it can also bring a sense of dullness to the sense of power and urgency in these special words. 
Our reading today about the realities of love is not meant for pretty, but for practice. They're not meant for pretty, they're meant for practice. As somebody once said, growing as a Christian is about moving from saying yes to the Lord of love to becoming more and more like the Lord in love. I said that. It was me. (laughs) Pretty good though, right? This is the progression of living as a Christian. It's practicing love. And practice will not make you perfect on this side of heaven, but practicing these things can make you a more loving person. Amen. So let's dive in. If you brought your Bibles, we're in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, What is, in part, disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Gracious God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Holy Spirit, move amongst us now. Help us to rely on you. Breathe your spirit and inspiration of love into us, that we might hear your voice, receive your love, and follow you. Amen. I think love is something that when you experience it, there's a gasp, there's a uh, a breath. I remember the first time I saw Denali from the airplane, uh, that incredible mountain in Alaska. When you fly over Alaska, it's just one incredible mountain after another. Let's start there. And uh, we were flying to Fairbanks, and the pilot came over the intercom and said, you know, we've got some flex time. I'm going to try to navigate the plane so both sides can see Denali, 20,300 feet of incredible mountain. And never having seen it before, (laughs) I had a micro thought of how will I tell which one it is from all these other incredible mountains I'm looking at through the window? How will I know which one is? And my thought stopped. Suddenly, this mountain was like reaching up to the airplane. There was a gasp from us on the left side. And then the pilot did this, and there was a gasp 
from the people on the right side. This majestic mountain. It just felt like it was coming up to us in the airplane. No other mountain came close. I give you that story because long ago in one of the first early Christian churches in Corinth, there was quibbling over various hills and valleys of living the Christian life. And they were failing to see the Denali in their midst, love. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter to Christians in Corinth because it was a community that was becoming riddled with division, ambitions, confusion. They had been one upmanshipping each other, arguing over esoteric matters, and they were forgetting to grasp the core work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, love. It's why at the end of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, after teaching on various spiritual gifts that we can practice and how they all have validity and also need each other, after a description of these spiritual gifts, Paul concludes chapter 12 with this statement that's a lead-in to our chapter today. And you almost need to hear Paul's segue statement in a movie voice. Are you ready? And now, I will show you the most excellent way. <laughs> the Corinthian Christians were becoming swayed by their culture. Some were fixated on a hyper-spirituality that brought a host of pride problems. They were passionate and about demonstrating spiritual abilities to each other, but they were poor in producing spiritual fruitfulness. They were obsessed with knowledge, but they were lacking wisdom. They were pursuing personal power, but neglecting the real power of love. Christians were taking other Christians into civil court rather than working it out together. There were issues of spiritual elitism, cultural influence, moral and ethical confusions. I'm so glad we in the church have gotten beyond all these things today. This is why Paul ends chapter 12 this discussion of a variety of giftedness and abilities and talents by saying, now I want to show you Denali, the most excellent way. It's love. Look again at how Paul ends our chapter today. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. Those are big, folks. <laughs> but the greatest of these is love. Let's break down what Paul is saying. First, I think he's stressing the essential, essential, the essentiality of love. So it's, it's my coined word, and yes, it's cringeworthy. But Paul is saying love is essential if you are a Christ follower. Will you say this with me? Love is okay. Let's all say it together. <laughs> love is essential. It's not an accessory. It's not an option if you're a Christ one. Paul is showing us here that love is more important. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm just a clanging symbol. Now in Corinth, in that church, there was a fascination with spiritual abilities, speaking in tongues, ecstatic speech of prayer offered in corporate worship, there was the abilities of prophecy, speaking out against injustice or social issues of their day with God's word. There was knowledge, being philosophically wise about how this world works. And yet Paul dismantles each of these by pointing out that the real markers of spiritual maturity is the sharing of love. 
He's saying it's possible to have impressive abilities and be spiritually bankrupt. We can serve tirelessly, give generously, and even suffer courageously, but if love isn't in it, there's nothing in it. The spiritual life is not ultimately measured by what we are doing for God, but how we are reflecting the character, the love of God in our life. And this is a warning for us in the church today. We are so tempted to measure success by attendance in numbers or theological precision or cultural influence or impact that we are having or sometimes simply by who wins, who wins, who won out, who comes out on top. But God measures success by love. Francis Schaeffer, the Christian writer and philosopher, once said, If we do not show love to one another, the world has a right to question whether Christianity is true. Just this last week, I was talking with another pastor here in town, and he was sharing with me quite tragically how his biological family has been splintered down to the very core over political issues. They no longer worship together. They no longer gather together in their family. They no longer share holidays together. They rarely talk to each other because their family has been split by political issues in our community right now. Francis Schaeffer says, if we do not show love to one another, the world has a right to question whether Christianity is true. So, lesson one, love is essential. My name is Andrew Ross, and I approve this message. <laughs> lesson number two, Paul looks at the facets of love. Have you ever gone to a jewelry store to, to buy something really nice? And they get out those lights that are brighter than the surface of the sun. I mean, they are so incredibly bright, they could make a pop tab off a can look. Whoa, that's really beautiful. Right. Well, in verses 4 through 7, Paul gets out his jeweler's light to shine what love looks like in practice. I like to call it the great 8 plus 8 because Paul lists eight positive factors of what love is and ate what love is not, okay? And it's as if Paul is holding up a diamond under this light, turning it slowly, letting the light catch each one. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It doesn't brag. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with what's true. Here are three things I think we should notice from these facets of love's diamond. Number one, love is a verb. There's no mushy poetry here. Please note that. There's no, oh, the love was like floating in a warm haboob of a desert rain with a rose. But no, none of that. According to Paul, love is not feelings, but actions. It's something you do. It's choices you make. Love chooses to be patient, to endure situations, to endure people. You know what that is, enduring people when they're especially people-y? You know, like on a Monday? Come on! Love is choosing kindness, taking initiative in serving someone else. Love doesn't brag. It's not obsessed with itself. Here's another facet of love's diamond. Love is expensive. It's a challenging part of Paul's passage here. He shows us that love is sacrificial. Love is costly. Love involves risk, putting yourself out there. 
And in a world we live in now where self-fulfillment, self-realization is prized above all, the biblical concept of love as sacrifice stands in stark contrast. I love what C.S. Lewis once wrote. He says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to be sure of keeping your heart intact, give your heart to no one. Lock it up in the safe or the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken because it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Love is a verb. Love is expensive. Thirdly, another facet is love is other-oriented. Paul reminds us that love doesn't insist on its own way which means love is willing to lay down your personal rights, comforts, and preferences for the sake of others. It's not self-centered. Friends, your life as a believer becomes more and more loving as you are more Christ-centered. As you become more and more Christ-centered, you become other-directed. In one of those Harry Potter books, there's a scene I appreciate the, the mirror of Erised, it's up in a room and somewhere up in Hogwarts, and, and up in this castle room, there's this magical mirror, Erised, and it shows you when you look into it, your deepest desires. Erised is desire spelled backwards, reflected back to you. Harry looks in the mirror and he sees his lost dead parents his longing to have them back in his life. His friend Ron looks in the mirror and he sees himself with awards and badges and trophies. Harry is cautioned about the mirror. He's told that people have wasted away their lives staring into it, fixated only on their own desires while failing to live. When Harry asks the wise Dumbledore what he sees when he looks in it, he says, well, I see myself as I am now, but with a pair of nice, thick, warm socks. Living a life of love is not staring into your own mirror of what you want, but actively loving the others God is giving to you. Paul also shows us here in this chapter the eternal luster of love. I I know I'm kind of sounding like a gem and mineral person right now, but there's this permanence of love. Paul wants us to see that real love is eternal. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. You see, the spiritual gifts the Corinthians were so eager to possess were, in the end, temporary. Our spiritual gifts are for building up of the church in this present age, but they are not the essence of what it means to live into eternity as God's people. Love alone is what lasts into God's eternity. Have you ever held a Sharpie pen in your hand? What, what's, what's the big factor about Sharpie pens? They're permanent. When you make a mark with a Sharpie, it doesn't wash off. I, I dare you to look through any of our classrooms in Northminster School and you will not find Sharpie pens. Right? And if you draw a little heart on your arm with a Sharpie pen, it will be there for quite a while. Friends, love... Real love is the Sharpie pen God lets us play with (laughs) because it's lasting. Its imprint doesn't fade or disappear or it's not forgotten. Paul says here, we now see in a mirror dimly, but then one day we'll see face to face. In this age, we know in part, uh, uh, we see in part, 
Our understanding is limited. Our experiences are partial. But there's coming a day when we will see clearly when the partial is swallowed up in completeness and the temporary gives way to eternity. That's love. Next, Paul talks about the modality of love, how it works. It's self-giving. It's other-directed. Uh, it's not romance. It's not just happiness. It's not feeling motivated. Paul uses a very special Greek word for love in this chapter, and the word is agape. Agape. It means a kind of love that is an act of the will, a choice, a commitment without conditions, no strings attached. And that's because it's our choices that define us, not our abilities. And so at this point, we can start thinking, well, how can we live in this kind of love? What about our bad choices? If we're honest, in 1 Corinthians 13, we also see how far short we fall from Paul's standard. And you know, if this is just left to ourselves, our abilities to love, this message would be discouraging. Friends, the modality of love working in us is from our model, Jesus. You see, Paul is not just giving us a list of moral virtues to strive for. He's pointing us to the one who embodies them perfectly. Only Jesus is the embodiment of this love. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus did not insist on his own way, but humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The only way we can love like this is by knowing we are first loved like this. We love because he first loves us. When you see Jesus, who had every right to condemn us, choosing instead to bear our sins in his body on the cross, when you see Jesus crying out, Father, forgive them, you begin to understand the breadth and depth, the height and length of the love of God. Lastly, we have to notice in this chapter the carriers of love. This diamond of world-changing force, is it just kept in a vault? Is it just kept in an expensive store? What is God's delivery system? It's us. It is the calling of God for us as Christ's church to show this love. Paul's teaching here was not meant to be just read at weddings. It wasn't meant to be dissected in Hallmark stores. It was not even written for everyone else out there in the world. No, Paul's writing was to a church. It was directed to Christians in a church in how we behave with one another and how we offer God's love out in the world. I pray that 1 Corinthians 13 will have more and more of an effect on us. I pray that as a church, we will be known for not just how impressive we are or our ministry programs or our wonderful music or buildings. Or I hope we are known for our love. A people who love Jesus, we see that he has loved us and we respond. Just this last week, I had a joy of visiting a dear brother in Christ who, uh, who is in his last days of life. But we were able to talk and visit and share memories, a few laughs. And as we talked and reminisced, 
about our lives together, Bible studies and projects and ministries, drip, drip, drip. A tear or two would keep coming down from his eyes, just tears. As he's smiling, talking, listening to me. And after we prayed and I went away, I realized those tears weren't just coming from his eyes, they were coming from his heart because his life has become so clear, a vessel of love. We shared that love together. I could feel the presence of Jesus as we talked, as we prayed. Friends, today, will you practice living love? Are there pipes in your life that need to be cleared out? Things you've been clinging to about yourself. Desires that have been fixating you rather than seeing others around you. Attitudes, opinions. What is it that might be getting in the way of you becoming a loving person of Jesus Christ? I've got two practical ideas if you really want to do this. One, I'm calling the 8 plus 8. I can relate. I think it's on the back of your sermon note sheet. Just between you and God, circle one of those. (laughs) Just circle one and make it your prayer. Lord, help me to get better at this specific. Here's another idea. It's an 8 to 15 love project this week. Uh, If you have a prayer list of people you're praying for, and I hope you do, What is one person this week you will invest love and care for because they need it? Now, if you're ambitious, you could do maybe one person from your list a day. But at least one. How can you show them, care for them, invest in them in a way that offers the love of Christ for them? Will you pray with me? Well, Lord, I'm going to just ask again, as I asked at the children's sermon, help me, please, Holy Spirit, to become a more loving disciple of your spirit and grace. And Lord, I pray that for my sisters here, my brothers here in this church. Jesus, help each of us and all of us to be the vessels of your love in this needy, hurting world. In our attitudes, in our emotions, Lord. With those who are close to us, with those who we get to meet for the first time, help each of us today and through the days of this week and beyond to be active agents of your grace and love. Jesus, that they may know you, that they may feel you, that they might find healing and help in you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.